In this video, I want to talk about five 70s prog albums that I think that you need to hear. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the really obvious ones. There's not going to be any Dark Sides of the Moon or Close to the Edge or Selling England by the Pound in this list. Instead, here's five albums that I think you need to hear but aren't necessarily the most obvious. Sorry based Camel's second album, Mirage, is just a stunning slab of 70s prog that may well, in using the album title of one of their later albums, leave you breathless. I remember the first time that I heard the final track, Lady Fantasy, the Lady Fantasy medley. Uh, it was significant because I'd only just gotten into prog at the time, so it must have been probably a decade ago now, like 2011. I'd just gotten into prog through Pink Floyd's The Wall and Marillion's Clutching at Straws primarily, and I saw in my YouTube uh, recommended, I saw the intriguing artwork of Mirage, this slightly distorted camel and this long looking song. And I wasn't that old, I had no idea that this was actually kind of cigarette packaging and there'd be a lawsuit and all sorts because it's not, it's not much changed from the packaging of camel cigarettes. So intrigued, I, I clicked on it and I started to hear Peter Barden's moody synthesized arpeggios as Andrew Latimer's guitar began to descend and crash upon this delicate loop. The song then suddenly breaks and shifts and is led by a gentle guitar melody. The vocals dreamlike, floating gently above the song. But before long it shifts again, increasing in tempo and intensity as the guitar playing goes from melodic to manic, before yet again settling down into a dreamy, dreamlike groove. And the highlight is certainly the last few minutes, which back in those days of YouTube was actually in a different video because that was when there were only 10 minute limits. So I had the first 10 minutes and then I had the last two minutes, 43 seconds in a whole separate video that I had to wait for it to load again. And that's where the song really takes off like a rocket. Um, just organ and guitars blaring and screaming and wailing and the culmination of the romantic fantasies alluded to in its lyrics. It's just magnificent. And the rest of the album may never reach the crescendo and emotional elation that Lady Fantasy does, but it's a beautifully coherent album which prioritises melody over exploratory experimentation. Some might find that to make it a little bit safe. It never tries to move the genre forward in the same way that King Crimson did. It's content with just focusing on great songwriting, great melodies with a prog rock aesthetic, rather than expanding the listener's musical horizons. All the familiar elements of prog are here. There's the moves, the flutes, the guitars, and they're all weaved beautifully and deftly together. The instrumentals such as Super Twister and Air Fries revolving around strong yet subtle melodies. It's not a hard prog album, it's the opposite. It's a delicate dreamlike record that you just it's better to just let it envelop over you rather than straining to focus and engage with it intensely like you might with a more jazz-derived prog album. There's really not a bad song on this album and considering its quality, it's a remarkably accessible album. It's why I wanted to open with this. Even a non-prog listener, I think, should be able to derive some enjoyment from it. Though for a seasoned prog fan, it also has some great hidden gems like Nimrod or the Nimrod or Melody, which is a Tolkien-inspired epic about Gandalf the White Rider. And it's reminiscent in terms even of King Crimson's Starless in terms of the atmosphere it creates in the White Rider section in the third part of the song. Dutch band Focus's second album is a magnificent record, which is eclipsed by the success of their biggest single, Hocus Pocus. Hocus Pocus, I'm sure, will be known to many, if not all of you, with its iconic and heavy driving guitar riff. It is an explosive rock song, and if you don't know it, well then, damn, are you in for a treat. I think guitarist Jan Ackerman, his playing here, is just some of the best lead guitar work on any record in the 70s as a whole. And that's across Moving Waves as a whole album, um, also known as Focus 2 in its original Dutch territories. His solos are just rightfully frenetic and just have a fluidity to them which is strangely reminiscent of later metal guitarists that would come along, perhaps more like Yngwie or someone. There's a pace and an intensity and a use of unusual scales that in 1971 no one was doing. Jimmy Page certainly even wasn't doing. 
and punctuate his guitar playing on Hocus Pocus with then some yodeling, some flute solos, and even a manic laugh at one point from Fijran Lear on organ and yodored vocals. And you have one of the most brilliant and distinct rock songs of all time. But this album isn't just a one-song wonder. We have beyond Hocus Pocus a diverse and ambitious prog record, every bit as ambitious as an Emerson, Lake and Palmer album. Take Le Clochard, or Bread, at track two, which is a classical guitar instrumental, accentuated with a Mellotron string effect. Or the title track, Moving Waves, which features really just Fige and his piano. It's a gorgeous, peaceful number. But the real meat and potatoes of this album is the 23 minute long eruption, long before Eddie Van Halen would make that song title far more famous. Hocus Pocus was always meant to be just a bit of a joke song. Eruption is the really serious piece on this album. It's a 23 minute long instrumental adaptation of Jacoby Perry's opera Eurydice. This opera is the earliest surviving opera that we have, having premiered in 1600. And it contains just, I mean, the song, and of course the opera, contains just two main sections to possibly even name. But generally, it follows the story of Orpheus, who's a great musician who travels down to the underworld to plead the gods to revive his wife, Eurydice, who died. And this really is a crazy, crazy work, channeling classical, jazz fusion, all sorts, broadly alternating between the softer, more atmospheric parts, and then the answers has got this kind of call reply kind of style going on, and I guess in the operatic sense. One section even features, I guess, Gregorian chanting, though it's not purely a cappella as Gregorian chanting traditionally would be. And it features harder jazz fusion inspired jam sections full of Mellotron and organs and Jan Ackerman's criminally underrated guitar play. There's even a callback to the riff of Hocus Pocus in one of the solos, which is a nice surprise to look out for, and a rather tasteful drum solo from Pierre van der Linden. Our drum solos are certainly a controversial thing in rock. I mean, sometimes they can be great, sometimes they can just, like, well, great, like in Iron Butterflies in a Garza de Vida, the full extended version, that's a great one. But then sometimes Cream, as good as drummer as Ginger Baker would, um, was, um, or sometimes go a little bit over the top. It depends, but here it's, it's maybe a tiny bit long, but it's actually pretty tasteful, and his drum work is, is just exceptional across the board. Eruption's not a piece for the faint of heart, and neither is Moving Waves. It is an ambitious prog album, and it might test your patience through some of its slower sections, but it's definitely worth the wait. A lot of prog tends to take influence from classical or jazz, eschewing the usual blues influences that the majority of rock music has, and certainly did have in the 70s. But the Straubs, while certainly incorporating elements of classical, come from a rather different tradition, that of folk music and folk rock. Hero and Heroine is their sixth studio album, and it came after a change in lineup. The Straubs are kind of one of those bands in the 70s with just a revolving door of members. I'm certainly not even going to try and list all of them. But some notable ones are keyboardist of Yes, Rick Wakeman, who appeared on a few albums such as Dragonfly and From the Witchwood, which are really good albums in their own right. But he left the album shortly before the Straubs achieved their real commercial peak in 1973. This is with a song called Part of the Union. It actually got to number two in the UK singles charts and came from the album Bursting at the Seams in 1973. And this song kind of became an unofficial anthem of the trade union movement, which was really, really strong in the UK at the time before Thatcher would then crush it in the 80s. And I mean, this song was big enough to an extent, I remember my history teacher um, for A-level history playing this song to us in class when we were learning about the 70s trade union movement. It was certainly their biggest break into the mainstream as they started to move into a harder rock sound. I mean, it's hardly Deep Purple or Sabbath, but it's a harder rock sound, and as a result, moving away from folk, and tensions in the band started to flare. And the only founding member and primary singer-songwriter, Dave Cousins, was just left with his fairly new, at that point, Dave Lambert on guitar. And they had to rebuild basically the entire band. And from this rebuild, they somehow managed to craft the album I view as their greatest masterpiece and an essential piece of folk prog, which I recommend even more strongly to you if you are at all a fan of Peter Gabriel era Genesis. <laughs> 
But in some ways, especially for being folk prog, it's a bit funny to talk about it as a prog rock album, especially compared to some of the other prog albums we're talking about today. The longest track is eight minutes long, and most songs are just about three minute affairs. But it's certainly a record that establishes its prog credentials early, with the epic, epic opener of Autumn. Synths and heavy bass coalesce together with a hypnotic drumbeat, single guitar notes occasionally echoing throughout before this grandiose Yes-esque Mellotron string arrangement kicks in. It's a long and winding journey throughout its eight minutes, going from acoustic folk guitar and Mellotron electric guitar with Dave Cousins softly singing in a manner that's instantly reminiscent of Peter Gabriel. And we'll get into the Peter Gabriel comparisons in a little bit. It's a really beautiful for a very, I guess, English, pastorally inspired song that moves and changes and just quite simply swept me off my feet the first time that I heard it. So it's not a surprise if after that first beautiful, beautiful song, you find yourself a little bit disappointed with the rest of Side One. But that's not to say it's bad. I, I do like Side One. But it leans maybe slightly more into typical rock of the 70s, which is a touch of prog here and there. Um, it does some vibes maybe of Wishbone Ashes softer tunes, like The Leaf in the Stream from their masterpiece Argus, little hints of that. Like the song Just Love, clearly an attempt at a single. Perfectly fine rock songs, some corny lyrics a bit. The better attempt at a single is Shine on Silver Sun, which is melodically gorgeous with a strong chorus. And it's just, yeah, it's great. Kind of a Cat Stevens, maybe, inspired lyrics and storytelling to it. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch. I don't know. I mean, there's like folk in your foot there, so it's hardly a bit of shock. But nothing really gets too proggy, aside from the opener, of course, until you get to side two. That's what makes this album essential listening. An opening with the title track, Hero and Heroine. It's a true folk prog song, being led by acoustic guitar and being driven forward by its electric guitar. This really, really kicks the album into full gear again, and everything is just so magnificent. Folk prog full of keyboards and great melodies, and the best Peter Gabriel era Genesis song that Peter Gabriel era Genesis didn't write. That's a mouthful to say, of Lay A Little Light On Me. I mean, it's shocking how much that song sounds like a Gabriel song and how much Dave Cousins sounds like Gabriel. But it's a mightily charismatic vocal performance. There's just such a great sense of flow and cohesion on this side. Yeah, maybe it never reaches the heights of Jeffrey Atoll's Thick as a Brick in the folk prog space. But God damn, it's not that far off. I never feel that heavier prog ever quite receives the same acclaim that its softer counterparts might and its more classically proggy prog like Yes, Floyd and Genesis do. But before anyone says, man, but, but prog metal, that's heavy as shit and that's super popular. Yeah, yeah we're, we're talking about 70s prog here, so don't, don't start with all that 80s, 90s, 2000s prog metal here. No, because granted there aren't a massive amount of examples of um, heavy prog really. But the creme to the creme in the field for me is Atomic Rooster's Death Walks Behind You. Never has a Hammond organ sounded as heavy or as dark as on this album. Atomic Rooster were a band formed out of the ashes of the crazy world of Arthur Brown, the band who spawned the hit single and psych rock classic Fire, one of my favourite songs virtually ever. And the organist and main songwriter for the Arthur Brown band was a guy called Vincent Crane, and he teamed up with the drummer of Arthur Brown, a certain Cole Palmer, to form the band. But before the release of this album, which was their second album, though their first released, I believe, in the US, Carl would go on to form the juggernaut that became Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Now, when we're talking heavy, it's important to clarify our terms. We ain't talking proto-metal here, not really. We ain't talking heavy metal, nope. And we certainly ain't talking prog metal. There's no John Petrucci solos here. We're talking about Deep Purple-esque heavy, intensely visceral blues rock, augmented with just one of the most menacing organ sounds that I've ever heard on a record. Crane just plays the absolute hell out of the organ. That's especially apparent on the instrumental tune, track two, I think, Vug, which is a very proggy jam. I mean, more proggy than anything Purple did, because that's the thing. There's, there is definitely some blues rock influence going on here, unlike a lot of um, other prog bands. But they are changing rhythms, they're changing times, they're changing, changing everything that prog bands change constantly, like over the period of the five minute running time of Vug. 
But Atomic Rooster are at their best on the title track here, with its simple though effective guitar riff and main melody, and you may hear the lyrics, Death Walks Behind You, about a million times, but you're really not going to care when you're listening to a band as cohesive and tight as this one. The atmosphere is just like nothing else in the period, and nothing else quite since. I mean, there's other bands that kind of did this heavier style, you could say maybe a band like Black Widow, but generally, Atomic Rooster are kind of in a league of their own, and the fuzz on this guitar tone is just monstrous. And John DeCan does a wonderful job as well on vocals, especially on another highlight called Seven Lonely Streets. But while the highlight is the fact that this is Prague in the 70s, which just satisfies that edge for something a bit heavier, you find yourself fancying something just that bit more technically complex and Black Sabbath or Deep Purple, then God, Atomic Rooster is just perfect for that mood. It's just also imbued though with great melodies and songwriting, like on the single Tomorrow Night. Uh, it has a wonderful 60s vibe to it, it's quite straightforward, it's actually quite light, it's got probably the softest keyboard tone of the record, maybe sounding a bit more just like Emerson, Lake and Palmer, who aren't a massively dark band generally, um, rather than the dark prog you get on Sleeping For Years on this album. Supergroups often have a reputation for being disappointing, despite what on paper can look like a wonderful group. And just because you have four or five really talented musicians doesn't mean that they're actually going to gel together and make great music. But usually, as a rule of thumb, if John Wetton's involved in a supergroup, well, it's probably going to be quite a good supergroup, since Asia, a really good band, and UK were a really good band. But in particular, this incarnation of UK and this album. It'll hardly shock you for me to say that this is a supergroup from the United Kingdom with a band called UK, and the album also imaginatively titled UK. But on paper, you have former King Crimson alumni John Wetton on vocals and bass. Yes, it's Bill Bruford on drums, quite possibly the greatest drummer of 70s prog, and maybe of the 70s. Eddie Jobson on keyboard and violins who played in Zappa's band, and the perennially underrated Alan Holdsworth, the guitarist's guitarist, whose knowledge and application of music theory on guitar is just second to none, especially in the period. There was no one playing like Alan Holdsworth. Even, even Zappa um, found him to be one of the best guitarists playing at the time. But luckily, these guys all come together to create a really beautiful album that's reminiscent of Wetton's three albums with King Crimson. If you're a fan of albums such as Starless of Bible Black, Lark's Tongues in Aspect, or Red, I think you're going to really like this one. The opening suite in the dead of night is just phenomenal a real classic. It moves through three different sections. It moves from In the Dead of Night, with its heavy guitar lines, glistening keyboards, and magnificently strained vocals from Wetton. There's just something addictive about Wetton's vocals, when he really pushes the limits of his voice and just strains them. I love it on his way with Crimson, and sometimes when he does it with Asia, it just, I mean, he's one of my favorite vocalists. He's got a wonderful, wonderful voice. But then this part gives way to the softly ambient and beautiful by the light of day, before ending on the rhythmic complexity and time signatures I couldn't even begin to count of Presto Vivace and Reprise. Just like hearing Dream Theater's The Dance of Eternity convinced me that Mike Portnoy was the best drummer in prog metal, the intro of Presto should convince you that Bill Bruford is just a god on drums. And it then goes back to the melody, part of the reprise, as you'd like in a typical circular prog fashion to end those 13 minutes. And if that was the whole album, you'd probably feel satisfied. But it's not, and despite a couple of weaker moments here and there, like Alaska, which is pretty much just a really long, long keyboard solo, and I'm not a big fan of, of long keyboard solos, but you have so many highlights that are worth listening to the rest for the guitar work on 30 years, or the electric violin solo on mental medication, or the lovely vocals on Nevermore by Wetton. It just makes the sound one that's really very listenable and enjoyable. Um, it, it does verge though on the jazzier side of prog, so it might take a few listens for you to get used to the complexity of its harmony and rhythms before maybe you can really settle into fully enjoying it. I know that on my first couple of listens it didn't really strike me as anything special. It definitely took a few listens for me to really understand and put together what I was listening to, um, but it's, it's certainly worth it. <laughs> 
If you made it this far, thank you very much for watching the five programs that I think that you need to hear. Um, I'm thinking of maybe doing this as kind of a series. Um, I'd love to do even some others in prog, such as five Canterbury albums or five Italian prog albums and all sorts of different genres and, and different styles that, that I could do with this. So please let me know if you want to see any more of these kinds of videos. And yeah, until next time, long live rock and roll.